If you're wondering why I'm out here in the middle of the swamp, well, if you take a look down here, this is the only native uh, vining Asteraceae, so dandelion family um, species in Michigan. This is Mecania scandens, scandens, and this species was thought to be extinct in Michigan for over a hundred years. This is probably one of the rarest species you can find in Michigan. It only grows in this specific area that I am right now. And you see, I'll try to get more, uh, find more individuals, but these are vines which are twining over this grass here. And these flowers, there's probably around like four or five florets, so um, to each flower. So these aren't actually, each one of these little things isn't an individual flower. It's made up of four or five little florets. You can see the little seeds poking out, the keens at the top. So these have already been pollinated right now and they're just maturing. So these are in Eupatoria tribe, which is the um, the Stevia tribe of Asteraceae. It's such a big plant family that they subdivided it. And this species typically grows on the Atlantic coastal plain. And right now this location here is over 100 miles disjunct to the nearest location in, in Illinois or Indiana. And this species typically grows in more tropical areas. So it's actually naturalized and invasive in a lot of tropical places like Hawaii, I think like South America, um, and Asia as well. But we're here in Michigan in this temperate climate. This is probably, this isn't the furthest north that this species grows, but it's probably the harshest climate that it grows in. And it just grows in this one specific area. So this was known from the late 1800s in Michigan um, by, a, uh, by a local sort of botanist. And uh, he had documented that this species has been known about since the uh, around the mid 1800s. And they, they went out here, took some, um, took some, I guess, samples, as you would say, and this species was actually lost since then, because I guess people didn't know exactly where these specimens came from of this species, so they thought it was just, uh, it had gone extinct. And then in 2012, a, um, a botanist named Jesse Lincoln actually came out here and rediscovered this in, like, actually coming out here I can understand why the species went undiscovered for over a hundred years because it is an absolute slog to get out here and and I only came out here because I knew that it was here I can't imagine just searching blindly it's really really cool it typically vines and grows on top of shrubs so I will try to um, look for more and see if I can get some better money shots but here you see the these are some buds they haven't gone off yet um, these are open ready to be pollinated and then we have some older ones that have already been pollinated but very very cool probably one of the rarest plants that you can find in Michigan well, I don't think I'm going to find any more Macania today. Um, tried to look for more, but they're really elusive. Um, and I know when they were discovered, it said they were abundant, locally abundant, but that was over 10 years ago. So I don't know if the population has changed or whatnot. But some of the other plants uh, that I found along the way, uh, this one... It's a relative of the carrot. This is, uh, the common name is water parsnip. Scientific name is uh, Sium suave or suave or something like that. So characteristic of APACA, the carrot family. It has flowers in these 
um, umbels. I guess these you could call these like double umbels because it's uh, kind of umbrella shaped. But then you see from each peduncle there's uh, probably like ten or so flowers in like a mini umbel there. So pretty cool edible but related to the extremely uh, toxic um, Secuta maculata water hemlock and looks very similar. Actually the way you can distinguish is that these leaves are once compound or once pinnate so there's like a main stem and leaves that come off of it. The leaves of water hemlock are bipinnate or double pinnate so from the main stem there's more stems that come off with leaves on them. And then these aren't flowering anymore, but these all this year are lizard's tail. Um, really cool native species, relatively uncommon, but when you find it, there, it's usually in these big clonal colonies in wetland areas. Um, got some marsh ferns, I forget what the scientific name for them is. We have these little bastards, these sting nettles. Literally made coming out here so much worse. And you also have a lot of these relatives of Macania in the same family, but in a different sub, in a different tribe. These are Symphiotrichum wood asters. And I don't know the exact species of this because that genus is a mess. But you can see they have that classic daisy shape with the ray flowers and the disc florets. And the, the in shape of the involucre of the flowers here is also relatively cup shaped, but it's more broad and less uh, long. And those macanias don't have any um, ray forts, no daisy rays, like the white petals here as well. And got some ash trees here. So there's actually a lot of ash in this forest, but they're they're all young trees. They're like shrub shaped because that once they get big enough, the emerald ash borer will knock them back. But they're still persisting in this form. And more nettle. So there is a lot of cool stuff out here and nothing as cool as the Macania. Um, it tends to grow in more open areas, I think. And but the problem is those open areas are also a whole lot wetter, so I can't really walk through them that easily. And apparently what they usually grow on is actually shrubs like this. They they climb up these uh, what are called button brush shrubs. You see the the fruits here. These are in Rubiaceae, the coffee family, and they're pretty ubiquitous in, in wet settings. And I guess from when they were discovered, they were discovered, um, the Macanias were discovered, they were climbing up on these shrubs and growing on them in more open areas, so say in an area like that down there. But I'm not going to go down there because of all the fucking nettles and the fact that I, I'd probably be ankle deep in water out there but yeah pretty cool so we got quite the change of pace from the swamp earlier this is the, the sand prairie we got a whole lot of this little blue stem grass prairie grass this is Skyzacrium scoparium, little blue stem. And another prairie grass here, this is Indian grass, Sargastrum natans, a little less common out here. And any prairie in Michigan is gonna have some species of liatris out here, a blazing star. These are really, really attractive plants. This is Liatris aspera, the rough blazing star, and this is in Asteraceae as well. 
So each one of these involvers has, mm, looks like around like 25 florets or so. Bright pink color, really showy, really attractive. And over here, we have a native sunflower, actually. Sand prairie species. This is the western sunflower. Helianthus is the genus Helianthus occidentalis. And um, a common name for this is the western sunflower, but it's a little bit of a misnomer because this w was named when the Midwestern US was like uh, Western, considered to be Western. So it's actually centered around like Michigan, Wisconsin area, the distribution. And they're relatively unique among sunflowers in this area in that most of their leaves are in this little rosette down here. There's a few little koan leaves on the stem, like right here. Then they have their flowers at the top, so their stem is mostly naked, per se. And then, another cool annu annual plant here is this. This is Polygonum articulatum. This is a relative of buckwheat. It's an annual plant that grows in these open sandy areas like this. And it's a really cool site. It blooms really late in the year and can be pretty easy to miss when it's not in full bloom like this. Pretty cool, I like that species a lot. So right here is another dandelion relative. This is, common name is Sweet Everlasting. The, um, the leaves, when you break them off and you smell them, they have a really nice sweet scent. And the species name is Pseudonephalium obtusifolium. So a little bit of a handful of a name, but it's because uh, Nephalia is actually a, ch um, a tribe of Asteraceae, just like um, how the Meccania was in Eupatoria. But I forget what tribe Pseudonephalium is actually in, but it's not in Nephalia. Um, it just looks like it, which is pretty cool. And of course, there's some goldenrods out here, some Soldago. and you can hear all the insects. Good vibes. Here's a close-up of these golden rods. By these road cuts, sometimes you get a little bit of a different plant community here. So here's the last of our prairie grass trio. I mean, there's others, but these are the big three. This is big blue stem, Antropogon gerardii. The tallest ones here are a little bit taller than me, but these can get a lot bigger than that. And over here, we have a species of Coreopsis, also dandelion family, daisy family, whatever. Uh, this is a lance leaf Coreopsis, uh, Coreopsis lanceolata. It actually has a very, very long blooming season for a plant like this. It blooms all the way from May, and this is like mid-September right now, and it's still blooming. And ignore the big bug on here, but this is a species, the family Fabaceae, 
the legume family, same as peas and stuff like that. This is Lespedeza um, capitata type of bush clover. It's pretty cool. That genus is interesting. This is another member of Lespedeza. This is Lespedeza herta. You can tell the difference because this has round leaves, or I guess rounder leaves than this. These are a lot skinnier. And we have some prickly pears here, native Michigan prickly pears. They stay like this all year. In the winter, they shrivel up. They bounce right back once um, once temperatures warm up. Got some fruits here ripening up. Still green. Those are the fruits. And a lot more of this little blue stem as well. And of course, more blazing stars. Really, really attractive plants. Butterflies love this plant. Got a really big patch of cactus right there. So all this diversity here in the sand prairie wouldn't be possible if it was illegal to burn this place. If you have seasonal fire, you can open up the ground, get all these species that wouldn't occur in a close canopy forest. So everyone talks about old growth forests and everything. Like that was what was from like Michigan to Huron or just from east of the Mississippi was just all old growth forests. It was not, there's savannas, prairies, and a lot of species, plants and animals who depended on that. So once fire suppression started, habitats like this dwindled and these wonderful species were driven into decline. So, it's really important to have diversity of habitat. So forests and savannas and prairies. Because if this was gone, there'd be no more cactus here. There'd be no more blazing stars, sunflowers bush clovers, anything like that. Got a cool butterfly. Got a little guy hanging out. There. That's uh, probably a moth, but still cool.